And then all of a sudden, and this can seem like, as you're reading this, this can seem like such like a bizarre narrative turn. <laughs> you don't see this generally when you're like reading, reading stories, you know, in your leisure time. Like there's this exciting buildup, you know, this ultimate showdown between Pharaoh and the God of Moses. And then we have uh, Exodus 12 and 13, and it's like, here's detailed instructions on how to have a Passover party for you and your neighbors. And here's how you make the meal. And here's how you, you know, uh, what, what you do with the different elements. And here's all their symbolic representation. You're just like, wait, what? Why, why is this significant? And what's being instituted there, what God is drawing his people's attention to, and what, what Moses and, and, and the, the prophets of God who would come after him were constantly calling the people back to, is that this story that is about to, to happen, what is it gonna happen on this Passover night, as the presence of God passes over the nation of Egypt, the spiritual Babylon, people in total rebellion to him. His presence, his angel is going to pass over and it's going to bring the death that their rebellion against God, what, what, it, it's the wages of sin, right? It's, it's, the, it's, the pain, it's the pain back for what they've earned. That's coming. And yet in the midst of that, God, he's judging a whole nation, but he's providing a way out for individuals. Whoever would choose to, sub to obey him, to submit to him, he says, look, as part of this meal, you're all going to eat a lamb together. And you're going to take the blood of that lamb and you're going to smear it over the doorposts of your house. And that blood will be a covering, will, is, is going to protect you. My presence will pass over. That's where we get the name. Of, of that meal. My presence will pass over you. Death will pass over you wherever I see the blood of the lamb. Now, you know, is, is Moses, you know, when, when he writes that, you know, is he, you know, giggling to himself and thinking, yeah, I know, you know, that's exactly all about Jesus. Uh, you know, may, maybe, maybe not. But God is certainly making a point and it's instituting this meal to be a, a, a yearly feast that they're going to partake, that they're going to eat this story together as a family, looking at all of the elements of the Passover meal that each represent different aspects of the story of Israel and Egypt and ultimately how God got them out, how he redeemed his people out of slavery and out of uh, death and subservience to, to the sinful world. Like that story, we're gonna tell that year after year, every generation is gonna hear, hear that story and interact with that story in a meal, which is so, such a Middle Eastern thing to do. Um, and it, we're gonna use that meal to teach future generations. And, and so we're gonna pause and reflect and think about that. And then, it, you know, the story moves forward and of course, yeah, the, 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 the angel of death comes, the firstborn sons, and actually the firstborn of everything, even animals, like all die. But everywhere that people heard the word of God and trusted, they trusted that the blood of a lamb would be enough to hold back the deadly presence of God's judgment. Where they trusted that, they were saved, they were rescued from death. Wow, like, yeah, this is, this is the Bible. Uh, this is exactly what Jesus meant. This is exactly what Paul meant, that this is, Bible is able to make us wise for salvation through faith in Christ. And so we're just like, wow, yay. And not only, not only do the Egyptians let them go, but like they're allowed, and they're slaves, remember? So like they probably don't have a lot of possessions, whatever. You know, they just have the clothes on their backs, but they're basically allowed to plunder Egypt on their way out. Like and the Egyptians are like giving them things, giving them gifts. They're trying to appease this Yahweh God that they don't know, but they've become convinced is the only real God and is the most powerful being in the universe. And they just want to make him happy by blessing these people that he seems to be enamored with. And they're just loading them up with treasure. 
Some people are even joining with them. Like we, we find out in the text, like there are some people from Egypt that just like, forget Egypt, forget Egypt's gods, forget Pharaoh. We're with these people. Like we want to go. We want to be a part of this community and, and we want to know their God and all of that. And so they, they go out as this, this huge force, like an army of people, a nation of people that wasn't a nation before that's just born in a single night. It's just amazing. And they go out. And, uh, you know, they're, they're going out with the idea, you know, what Moses had been telling Pharaoh is the whole reason why Pharaoh was to let God's people go is because God wanted to meet, draw his people out into the wilderness and meet with them in an intimate way. And uh, that they were going to have a, a, a form of covenant or there's there 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 implication there that, that there's something really special that God wanted to do with his people. But he needed to get them out of Egypt first in order to do that. And he was going to meet with them in a, in a unique, intimate, personal way. And so they're, they're expecting that, right? They're going out, you know, God's done all these things. And now we're going to go and, and meet with him. And like, what is that going to be like? And all this anticipation. And they get as far as the Red Sea. And, you know, they stop because, you know, there's the sea there. And they make camp. They're trying to figure out why has God led them here. And then they look back. And at this point, Pharaoh's had another change of heart. And he's, you know, massed up his army. And you've got all the chariots and all that. And they're... You know, you can only imagine what that probably looked like in the distance. And especially in Egypt, you know, the, the, the dust, you know, has been kicked up. And they probably just see just this hugely impressive, you know, army, like anything out of any movie you've ever seen. Like, you know, it's coming, bearing down on them. They're like, oh, they're going to massacre us. And, and anybody who doesn't survive is going to be hauled back into slavery. You know, we're now caught between the sea, which is, you know, we know the sea is, is death. Like... We're just going to drown. We can drown in the sea or get killed and enslaved by Pharaoh. We're caught between slavery and death. And of course, you know, the people turn to Moses and like, you know, thanks a lot. You know, what's God's, what's your God's problem? You know, there weren't enough graves in Egypt that uh, he had to bring us out here to bury us. Um, this is in Exodus 14. And, you know, if it was a movie, you know, probably Moses would be like, you know, everybody grab your swords and, you know, we're, you know, we'll put sticks, stakes, sharpen stakes up, you know, like, just like you see in a, you know, big epic movie and, you know, we'll, you know, form a battle line and, and dig, you know, trenches and we're going to go to war and make our stand here and blah, blah, blah. Like none of that. He does none of that. What does he tell the people to do in Exodus 14? Um, he tells them to do nothing. He says, be good imitators of our father Abraham and be quiet and do nothing. This is uh, verse 13 of chapter 14 of Exodus. He says, fear not, stand firm, and see. Watch. See what? See the salvation of of the Lord, the salvation of Yahweh, which he will work for you today. What work are, are the Israelites going to do to get their own salvation? Zero. They're not going to do any work. Who's going to do all the work? Yahweh God. And this is another one of those key verses. If you want to highlight or underline or remember, um, this is the first time that salvation the word salvation shows up in the story at this verse. And you think about like when I, the first time I saw that, it just like blew my mind. So here we are, we're all the way through Genesis, all the way now, maybe, you know, a third of the way into Exodus. Have there been times in the story where the author could have chosen to use the word salvation in a sentence? Have people ever been rescued here or saved from anything here? Totally. But again, it's like, it shows you like the literary genius behind these books it is that he's he's waited he's held on to this word salvation up until this point because this is the moment this is the scene whenever you hear salvation from this point on Exodus 14 through the whole rest of the Hebrew Bible when that Hebrew word shows up you're always going to think about this moment this is the definitive picture of salvation in the Hebrew Bible and what is it it's God's people being caught between slavery and certain death and God's saying, be still, but be, stand firm, trust me, 
and watch what I will do. And you know what the Hebrew word for salvation is there? Yeshua. It's Yeshua. It's Yeshua, which, you know, is the name of Jesus. You know, in Greek, it is Jesus, which then became Jesus that we use today. So it's Jesus. So God's, God's literally saying, fear not, stand firm, and see the Jesus of Yahweh. This is him showing up. This is what it looks like. And we see what happens is the Spirit of God comes. And just like the Spirit of God was there hovering over the waters in Genesis 1, was able to come and, and push back the waters and produce dry ground, here comes the Spirit of God to come and push the waters back and provide a way out, provide an escape for God's people, a way to life that is his Yeshua, his salvation. And all they have to do is step out, step onto that dry ground that God's provided in faith, to trust. Because, and believe me, I'm sure it took a lot of trust to walk however many miles between these huge, two huge walls of seawater that looked like they could come crashing back down and just crush you instantly at any moment. Did that take faith and trust? Yes. But that's all God asked of them to take this step and to trust. What were they trusting in? They were trusting that God is good and that he didn't bring them there to kill them, that he actually was providing a way of escape and life and blessing and good for them, that God's character is good. If they could trust that, they could be saved. And so every person who set foot, who stepped out into this dry land that was part of the Red Sea could walk across into new life. This, by the way, becomes the picture later um, when the Israelites go into the Promised Land many years later um, in crossing over the River Jordan. There's a similar picture like this where the waters parted and they walk on dry land. And it's a call back again to this moment. It's a reaffirming of God's commitment to bring Yeshua, to bring salvation to his people as they step out in faith and trust of him. And by the way, then this also becomes the picture from which we draw um, the significance and the meaning of baptism. Because that's what, ba baptism is intimately connected to this moment of going into what seems like death and coming out the other side in life and salvation. Whoa, and so they go through, um, Pharaoh tries to follow him through, but they don't trust God or love God or following God, they're just chasing after them. And of course they reap the death. Um, that was theirs to reap um, for the rebellion. And so then we have uh, the Song of Moses and Jephthah. It's funny. And you'll see this happen several times um, in, in some of the narrative stories um, of the Hebrew Bible. Is like when something really, really significant happens, uh, they'll, especially when, when a great saving work has just happened in the story. Um, you'll, you know, you'll read about the story, you'll read about what happened. And then right after that, uh, somebody will sing a song about what just happened. And it'll be like almost exactly what you just read in the same chapter, only now it's in poetry and, 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 and lyric, you know, and verses. And uh, that becomes part of the, the, the pattern and practice um, of God's people, is that, God, uh, that God's people are constantly being rescued um, by God. And when they're rescued, they, they sing a new song in response to their salvation. And it becomes, you know, and songs are great, right? We, why is music so popular? I mean, it's, it's songs capture um, things in our heart and our imagination that, that uh, we can't always just express um, with, with a monologue, right? Or even like just a list of praises, but it's, it makes us want to sing. It's, songs are celebratory. It's like we want to we celebrate, we want to party because of what God has done. And then also, the great thing about songs is that it's a lot easier to memorize and remember a song than it is to remember a big long speech about what God did. And so then it becomes something that becomes easy to teach our children, teach the next generation. It becomes part of our culture and part of our identity as we continue to sing the old songs of how God has rescued us and continue to uh, sing new songs as we have new testimonies, uh, fresh mercies, fresh salvations of God. Um, then be also become part of our cultural story as the people of God. And so that's, that's what's taking place here. 
um, in Exodus 15. And so it's just like, yay, that's great, that's awesome. And so they continue to go along. And so it's what this is leading up to, which this whole thing has been leading up to, is this, this pivotal moment here um, at Exodus 18 and 19, where God's going to do what he said. He's going to meet with them in a unique way. Something really special is going to happen when they get to this mountain, uh, Mount Sinai. And uh, that becomes sort of the, uh, the kind of a shift, because then they're going to spend a whole year camped out at Mount Sinai. And that's where all the laws and all that stuff that people associate with the Torah and with the Old Testament. That's like, that's where all of those are given. Um, it's going to take up all, all this part of Exodus, and then we'll see later in all of Leviticus and in the first part of Numbers and all of that. And I just want to point out that, you know, we get all the way up to here, and um, we haven't had, like, any, like, lists of laws yet. And so just keep in mind that... that, that it, it's not, it's sort of disingenuous, disingenuous to think about the Torah as just being, you know, the law. And that's why I, I like uh, the translation of Torah as teaching a lot better because this is all teaching you. It's teaching, it's taught me and, and it's taught, you know, hundreds of generations, you know, before us about the character of God, the purposes of God, our identity in God, all of those things. Um, and there is a pretty significant chunk about with their laws too, but even that we'll see has a purpose that's meant to teach us something. It's not about the, just the laws themselves. Even in the laws, we are learning things about God and about ourselves. So it's all been building up to this. And, uh, but before we get to Mount Sinai, and this is significant to be, and, it, and it's sort of um, maybe whiplash inducing because, you know, you're thinking of coming off of this experience, right? The walk, going through the Red Sea and they're watching your oppressors, your, the, your slave masters receiving their, their due ju punishment, the justice of God. And you feel total vindication. You've now experienced redemption. Like there's no slave masters to go back to. Like you're free. You're really free. No looking back. That's awesome. And now we're on our way. We're on this road trip. And like God is like leading us like in this manifestational cloud of his presence that turns into fire at night to, to give us light. Like it's just amazing. And then we read this series of stories um, about the people just complaining and complaining and grumbling. They, they grumble um, about uh, water, <laughs> not enough water, no bread to eat, um, and no meat. And, and God has to show up and, and provide all these things for them. And, you know, he, he provides water from a rock, which is, you know, wild. He provides bread that, that literally falls out of the sky as these flakes. Um, that's called um, manna, which in Hebrew means, what is it? <laughs> like, that's, that's exactly what that means. In Hebrew. It's kind of funny. Like, like what is it? Exactly. <laughs> We don't know. It's bread from heaven. Um, you know, he, he, miraculous ways he provides quail for them to eat, just a huge flock of quail to provide meat. But it's all this grumbling, and it can be like so, like out of nowhere, like how in the world could these people uh, turn on God and on Moses, like on a dime, like really? like, And, and again, just like when we were looking at the stories of, of the patriarchs of, of Abraham and Isaac and and Jacob and, and his kids, and we see these people that are like, have these amazing encounters with God, right? Amazing encounters. And we think to ourselves, man, if I was having encounters of God like that and those kinds of visions and dreams and things like that, like there's no way I would then go and do the thing that that person did. Like no way. And, and, and we do the same thing with Israel here. We think, wow, if we were with that group of people and we'd seen the, the 10 plagues, if we watched that, that Passover night, what happened, and, and how God rescued us out of there. If we had been part of the group that crossed the Red Sea, there's no way we would have been not trusting God to give us bread and water. Like, no way. And then we go about our day, and, you know, it's the person at work, or the family member, or the neighbor, or whatever, who just, oh, ticks us off the wrong way, and we say the thing we shouldn't have said, or we do something, or we, we lie, or whatever. And then we're like, oh. 
Yep, that's me. That's me in the story too. And that's, that's a, a good thing to keep in mind because it is super easy and, and it's intentional. I really believe it's intentional that the, the writer of Exodus wants to uh, tempt us to think um, of ourselves as more holy and more righteous than these people by putting these stories just right back to back. Like, oh, wow, amazing miracle encounter with God. Whoa, total rebellion and disobedience. Almost as if to tell you, look, it doesn't matter. Like even if you, if God gave you the thing, the dream, the vision, the, the miraculous sign or wonder, that's not really, it's not that your heart is out of alignment with him because you just haven't seen enough miracles in your life yet. That's, that's not what it's about. And if he gave you that, that wouldn't fix you. It's not about, God can prove himself to you over and over and over again. And it's not gonna fix your heart. That's not what it's about. And so the, the obvious question is then what is? Well, that's why we keep reading the story because that's what the story is trying to answer for us. How, and that's, that's one of the burning questions um, of the Torah. And as we go on, we'll see that. It becomes the challenge at the end of the book is how is God gonna fix this fundamental brokenness in the human heart? And that's to come. And you're thinking, well, maybe, you know, when they get to this place, that God is leading them to, maybe something will happen that will that will fix that will fix them that will, that will help them to either understand the right things or believe the right things or whatever, agree with the right things. That's that's gonna uh, turn this, this frown upside down. And uh, uh, along the way, um, there's some some challenges um, beyond just the need for water and food and all that. Um, there's uh, some uh, uh, people group um, that are. Uh, don't like the Israelites and uh, are wanting to attack them and see, are threatened by them and all that, these uh, Amalekites. And uh, there is a significant battle that happens. And uh, the only reason I point this out, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on, on that. You can read it for yourself and, and see the, the context of it. But this there's something interesting that happens um, in Exodus 17. So the, there's a, a battle and, you know, what, what kind of... Uh, warrior people are the Israelites at this point. Uh, not really <laughs> warrior people to speak of. They, what have they been doing? They've been uh, making bricks mostly and, and taking care of animals and things. I mean, they've been slaves. And before that, you know, they were sort of shepherds uh, in the land. And so it's not like they've ever had to go to war <laughs> against another group of people before. And now they have a group of people that uh, know how to do war <laughs> and uh, is coming to, to war against them. And, and yet God, uh, again, invites them to, to trust him, to place their faith in him, and believe that he can rescue them and bring about, again, Yeshua, bring salvation to them. And so that's exactly what happens. And we have this really interesting picture of, you know, uh, Moses is in this place where he can overlook kind of the battle. He's kind of in a high place. And God basically says, like, as long as your arms are raised above your head like you're gonna win and so he raises his arms and then uh, his brother Aaron and another guy named Hur um, come alongside to hold up his arm so that they can uh, continue to win the battle because whenever he lowers his hands um, the Amalekites started winning again and so uh, it's just this crazy wild story but then at, what's significant um, at the end of it that I just want to draw your attention to uh, is verse 14 Exodus 17, then, then Yahweh, the Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial in a book and recite it, in other words, speak it out loud, in the ears of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And you know, Moses built an altar and called the name of it, the Lord is my banner. And, and I just draw that to your attention because this is a kind of another significant moment in the story um, of the Bible because this is actually the first time uh, God tells somebody to write something down and preserve it in a book so that future generations can read it and recite it and ponder it and, and meditate over it. And so this is sort of uh, our insider from the, it's within the Bible itself telling us and teaching us about how the Bible was put together. You know, a lot of people have questions. Um, it's even, you know, to this day about 
you know, trying to understand like how, how did we get this book? And there's like so many different names of people in it. And did all these people write it? And, and who decided which books got in the Bible and which didn't? And, and all those types of things. And what did that look like for this to be written down? Like what, what, was, what was behind the scenes? What, what did that, if I was standing there, what would I have seen? And, and this is exactly the kind of thing that it looked like. It looked like God saying to people, hey, uh, I, I just rescued you from something in a miraculous way and in a way that wasn't just for your rescue. It has implications for future generations and how I rescue people and, and, and what uh, faith, how faith in me makes you, once again, we're going back to Paul and 2 Timothy, uh, making us wise about salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And so God's just telling people, write that down. And so clearly Moses wrote it down. And then at some point, along with other things that God told Moses to write down, um, it was all collected together um, into scrolls and then eventually into these books and Bible apps that we now carry around today and take for granted. But, but this is a, a really cool picture and insight into sort of the, the process of what it looks like. And isn't it interesting that the first thing in the Bible that God tells someone to write down and preserve as part of the Bible is a story about God stepping in and rescuing his people from certain death where they have to trust and do something by faith, like have some old guy raise his arms up for hours. And through that, God brings about rescue and salvation for his people. And that's the first thing that God has anybody write down about the Bible. So yeah, I just wanted to point that out. It's just a, a fun little thing that happens here while they're on the road of grumbling. And so then eventually they get to uh, this mountain, Mount Sinai, where God is going to meet with them. And it's, you know, it can seem really bizarre. Okay, he's gathering all the people and they build this altar and then they slaughter a lot of bulls and there's all this blood and they're like splashing the altar with blood and they're splashing blood um, on the people and it's just... You know, you begin to wonder why is this significant? Why is this in here? This seems kind of gross. Um, but what is happening here at this mountain is, is incredibly significant and important for them and for future generations because what, what God is leading his people in is actually the, the ancient Middle Eastern equivalent of like a, a wedding ceremony. And they are basically, as a people, you know, God's not going to uh, have them cut up, you know, 100,000 bulls and have to all walk through them all like he did with, with Abram, just to make the point to them. But he is, he is sl the, the slaughtering of these animals and the blood that covers, it's already pointing back to what just happened in the Passover and the symbolic meaning there and the, the death that they know is... The, the, the just payment, the payment, the paying back of the rebellion and their disobedience and even the grumbling that they just did before getting to the mountain. That's my little cute picture of the mountain. Um, like that, that death is taking their place. These animals that are being killed is taking the place. Like God should have like immediately destroyed them when they got to the mountain because they're just so uh, against him and fighting him tooth and nail along the way, even as he's providing for them out of himself and miraculously. And, and so there, there's that element of it. There's the element of they're signing into a contract. And it's not just any contract. It's not like a, they're making a land deal with God, even though land is going to come into play. It, it's, it's more intimate than that. It, it, is, it is a marriage. God is, is marrying his people. 